Stand by to the floor in five, four, three, two, one. Coming to you live from the rich heartland of Altamont Springs, Florida, it's The Vic Show with Victor Bowers, brought to you by Super Channel WACX-TV. Take it away! <laughs> Greetings. Greetings. Da, 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 da. I'll sing into a tiny hand. Da, 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 na, na. Praise him. Da, 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 na, na, da, 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 da. The thing up holy hands. Hello, welcome to the Vic Show. <laughs> I was trying to be serious, but it doesn't work. It's because I break out with props. And because when I hear cheesy organ music from a Hammond B3 organ, which this is, I just it just evokes what this. It just evokes good times and happiness and feeling good, right? So welcome to the Vic Show. I hope you're doing well and enjoying our background music and um, all that. And uh, the Vic Show, yes, coming to you live and in color. When we produce this show, it's a live production, live. So whatever's going to be said is going to be said. And uh, I'll tell you what's going to be said in the next few moments is the word of the Lord's going to be said. That's what's going to be said, the word of the Lord proclaimed. I've had such a revelation lately of the word of the Lord. Um, and it's just kind of beginning to reshape my um, my insides, and um, it's, it's powerful. And so I may share some of that. But speaking of word of the Lord, in regards to the second person of the Trinity, the Word who became flesh at a point in time and dwelt among us, as John tells us in his Gospel, when we name him Jesus, you know. And um, but in that, I feel the word, the Lord has given me a word for you, or for somebody, or for y'all. The universal you, all of you out there, because it's uh, something that Paul spoke. So it's not really a word of knowledge. I'm not calling it anything like that. It's just something that was an impression on my mind as I was beginning to think about today and this moment. I'm Victor Bowers, Super Channel WACX TV and uh, local Christian TV station and um, sharing the word of the Lord over television. That's what we do here. And we've been doing it uh, in one, this one market, Orlando, Central Florida market for over 40 years and have been blessed to do it. And uh, the Lord called my father and mother back in the 70s, in the mid 70s, and um, they stepped out in faith and did some things that had not been done that they knew of, not had, had not been done in their community, which was Central Florida. And uh, the Lord blessed, and the Lord led, and, and the Lord continues to do that. And when I say the Lord, what do I mean by that? Because that sounds like church. Well, God, 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 the God, the maker of the universe, the person who made you, whether you admit it or not, whether you know it or not, there is God. Hallelujah. I love yeah, we have an eight-track tape in the back, and it just runs until someone stops it. So um, maybe that's the, that's the word of the Lord, the hallelujah chorus. Look at that. I don't know if the people in TV land hear that. I don't know. But I heard it. That's what matters. Um, so I can say what I'm going to say. But yeah, so the word of the Lord was um, is, is something that we've been proclaiming through preaching on this TV channel for over 40 years. Started in... 1978. We were founded in 1977, in July of 1977, but in 1978, January 23rd, 1978, was our first broadcast, our first foray onto a local TV station channel in Leesburg. And we've been on the air ever since, and God has been good. And people have, people have joined in the vision, the people have heard the word and have joined in through support, through prayer, through finances, through giving, through volunteering. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have physically contributed in their lives, in their sweat, 
in their finances, in their time, in their prayer, to what God's doing here. And that's part of the whole vision of the world that God set in motion in his son 2,000 years ago, when there's the life of Jesus, his death on a cross, his resurrection from the grave, which was something unexpected, and um, it's what changed everything. Because when someone rises from the grave, as Jesus did, you have to talk about it. And that's what we've been talking about ever since. So that's a little bit of backstory, and I hope it blesses you. There was, I was out, this weekend was a holiday weekend when we're taping this, and so I went on a small uh, journey with my parents up to West Florida, which is uh, near Tallahassee, Dothan, Alabama area, that part of the state. We ventured into, we stayed in Dothan, Alabama, and to see some family there. And um, on the way back, driving back uh, Saturday night, or no, Sunday night, excuse me, just uh, once we got off I-75, if you know the area, there's, you travel on I-75 through, through the middle of Florida, and then you get to the turnpike if you want to head towards Orlando or head towards east. So we did that. And as soon as we got off of the turn, onto the turnpike at I-75, there were homes everywhere being built. The villages, which were up in that part of the region, had ex has, have expanded to that point. The villages is a huge community um, being developed and it's thousands and thousands and homes, new home development all the way from I-75 east into the Orlando area. It was, it was mind boggling. When my parents moved here in the 40s, uh, not, excuse me, not in the 40s, in the 60s, they were born in the 40s, but don't let that, forget that, okay, strike that. When my parents moved here in the 60s, I thought to my, I, I said this to my parents in the car, when they moved here in the 60s, all this land that we were driving through as we were driving on the turnpike was all orange groves. Yeah. It was all orange groves. That's what had been growing here since the early 20s, wow. 1920s, when nothing was here except developers, agricultural development came here and they planted, uh, they had ca cattle, raising cattle and growing oranges. That's all they did. And um, then things begin to change and the demographics begin to change and the weather begin to change. And so the citrus industry moved south. And um, so now all this is becoming homes. And I thought to myself, there used to be oranges growing here. Now there are homes growing here. Homes are coming out of the ground where oranges used to come out of the ground. Now homes are coming out of the ground. The ground is sprouting homes. Everywhere there used to be an orange tree is now a house. I mean, it's astounding. And I thought, the kingdom of God, something's going on here in central Florida, where we live. And so it's exciting and so glad you're a part of it. And uh, that's just some update on Super Channel and thanks for all your support over the years. We really do appreciate it and value it and recognize it. Nothing goes unobserved here at Super Channel, and we thank you for your support over the years. But the word I wanted to deliver, I was reading out of 1 Corinthians, and this is a letter that Paul wrote uh, to uh, the church in Corinth. Corinth was a city in Greece, and uh, it was the Greece, uh, excuse me, Corinth, it was a city right at the crossroads of a trade route between Asia Minor and Italy. And it was a, it was a very affluent city, Corinth was. It had been destroyed around 150 by the Romans when the Romans were invading, the Greece, uh, invading Greece. And then 100 years later, I think in 44 BC, Julius Caesar, who was ruling Rome at the time, realized the the, the property value of this area. And so he rebuilt Corinth as a Roman city on Greek soil. And it had a unique identity as that. And it was a hub of trade and of commerce and of leisure. And there was a huge center of worship there to the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love and erotic sex and passion. 
and that was part of their re cultic religious system in Rome and, and the ancient cultures. And so was, Corinth was a thriving metropolis. It was the place that could be likened to a mix of Las Vegas and New York City. And anything went there. There was money, beauty, power, prestige. And there was a new little church there that had been planted by Paul. And we had a pastor named Sosthenes, who was the pastor, who was a, it was, came out of the, the, the synagogue, but a new church had developed. And Paul was writing this letter to them because there are some things going on in the church that he wanted to address. But in the opening of his letter to the Corinthian church, you know, in the Corinthian church is much like our culture today. Anything goes. There was lots of affluence. Everybody was finding their own way. There was an educated group. And um, people could kind of, it was a life of leisure. It was a, an affluent lifestyle that you could have in Corinth. If, if like America, if you went there with a dream, it, it could become reality because there's a lot of business, a lot of opportunity in Corinth. And as a result, there's a lot of people living their own way, destructive lives, and they didn't know any better. So the, Corinth, the church in Corinth was a vital church but some weird things were beginning to happen in it. And so Paul writes a letter to the church, and it's called 1 Corinthians, we know it. And, but in the very first three verses is where I want to start, because when I was reading it, it really struck me. And so that's just kind of where I wanted to start. And I'll just read for you the um, first three verses of 1 Corinthians uh, ch for chapter 1. It's Paul's opening, but because in his opening, he packs a ton of information in it. And there's one or two words in there that are unique, and they struck me. So this is what he wrote. 1 Corinthians, uh, thankful for God's grace is the subtitle. Paul, he identifies himself immediately, which was the style of Greek letter writing. Paul, called by God's will to be an apostle, of King Jesus, and Sosthenes, Sosthenes, our brother. So he's introducing who's sending this letter to them, Paul and Sosthenes. To, who's it to? God's church at Corinth. The church who's made holy, made holy in King Jesus, called to be holy with everyone who calls on the name of our Lord, King Jesus, in every place. Their Lord, indeed, as well as ours, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and King Jesus, the Lord, our brother. I added the our brother part because that's the implication. God, our Father, and if Jesus is the Son of God, which he is, and God is our Father, and Jesus is his Son, and we are, brought, we are grafted into the family of God through Jesus, Jesus is our elder brother. I'd just like to mention that. Because that, for me, that makes Jesus very relatable, that I have an older brother named Jesus, King Jesus, in the spirit, and that I've been given his spirit. It's just, it's just beautiful to me. Anyway, let me read it out of a different, a different um, version, and then um, we'll carry on. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, we write to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. They're sanctified in Christ Jesus, and they are called to be saints. They are sanctified, they are holy, and they're called to be holy. Paul uses that language, sanctified, that means holy. So Paul is writing to a group of of believers, perhaps like many of you, who he calls them holy in Christ Jesus, and he makes them to be holy. They're holy in Christ Jesus, and they're being made holy. And I, like, I thought, what, is he ta what does that mean? What is the implication of calling someone holy and then saying they are being made holy? What does that mean? Later on in the, in the chapter, he goes down and he's talking about that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, uh, verse, well, the rest, rest of verse 2, with all that in every place, call upon the name 
of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Call upon the name... Call upon the name of the Lord, that's an Old Testament phrase. What does calling upon the name of the Lord mean? What does Paul mean? He's using the word holy, he's using the word being made holy, and he's using the phrase call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, Victor, what are you, what are you getting at? What, you're losing me here. Okay, here's what I mean. When I read this, it struck me because I read this and I read this as if Paul's writing it to me. And so he's saying, Victor, you are holy. You are holy in Christ Jesus. You're a follower of, God, you're a follower of Jesus by faith. We've had the salvation experience, the born-again experience, which we talk about and you hear about in churches. People live, give their life to God. You know, you've all, as, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm mainly here talking to fellow believers, people who've had the salvation experience. Well, the, the thing is, you are holy. You are holy. And what is holy? Is holy the way you dress? Is holy the style of music you listen to? Is holy, uh, is, is the gauge the, how big your Bible is? What is holiness? What is holy? Holy is being set apart for special purpose. That's what holy is. Like, I'm a violin player, and I have a good violin, and I have several bows, several violin bows. But one bow is my holy bow. It's, better, it's I only play certain music with that. Not because, it, it, not because of any other reason except it's a bow that is, is fine and has delicate and is, it's a well-made bow and I, it allows me to play classical music in the way it needs to be played. If I'm hammering or sawing away on country fiddle or if I'm just playing around with friends or if I'm playing outside at an outdoor event where it may be rainy or wet or too hot, I'm not gonna use my good bow because it's expensive and it's, it's somewhat fragile and delicate. It's, and so I use it only for special purposes. It's, it's set apart. There's a holiness to it, to this violin bow, that makes it different than the rest. It's been set apart. That's what holiness means, is you're set apart for special purpose by the maker. That's the, that's the thrust. Paul is calling these people holy not because of their life. And the rest of the letter, he's critical of a lot of their behavior, bad behavior. I mean, there's, there's incest going on. There's a young man sleeping with his, his, his father's wife, his, ex, his stepmom. Yeah, and he addresses, he addresses it directly, and he nails it, and he's pretty harsh. So it's not the lives of these people that are making them holy. If you read the rest of Corinthians, they're a rough bunch. But he calls them holy because they are in Christ Jesus and they have called upon the name of the Lord. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, so just stay with me because this pertains perhaps to many of you who are following Christ, yet you struggle inwardly with the holiness issue. And you can sometimes feel the shame and the guilt because of things you do or things you think or things you say or just those dark areas of your mind that still affect you. Perhaps there's a behavior, there's a habit, perhaps there's a secret addiction, perhaps there's something that perhaps no one else knows about, which is probably not true, because there's people always know things, and they just don't say it. But that's neither here nor there. But it affects you, and it affects your relationship with God because you feel dirty on the inside and you don't feel holy, and you, it makes you wor feel worse because you want to serve the Lord, you want to be good enough, you want, and even that is a form of self-righteousness, and that only adds to the problem of wanting to feel more holy when you know you're not holy, and why does God, it just spirals out of control, and the enemy just feeds on that, like, a, like, cancer, like, like cancer feeds on sugar, the enemy feeds on that guilt and that shame that we can feel inside when we want to be one thing, yet we perhaps are dealing with something else and it affects us. But Paul is saying, Corinthian church, and to you, you are holy in Christ Jesus. It's already been done in his son. 
you are a follower of Christ, if you've experienced, had the born-again experience where you've come into the family of God and you've accepted the gift that God offers in his son, then you have been made holy. It's already done. It's already done. Now, there is also the second half of this phrase where they are called holy and they are called to be holy. There's the response. And perhaps it's in the response where there needs to be more attention. Let me read it again now that you've had a little bit of an overview of where I'm going. This is, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. This was call, God's called Paul. God is, Paul is setting his credentials out at the very beginning because there was some dispute about Paul and his ability to be who he was. The church was trying to argue with him about his, his credentials. And so Paul knows who he is, and he says, listen, I'm Paul, and God called me. I'm self-ordained by God. You don't got to worry about my college degree. You're my church. God's called me over you because God called me. So I'm Paul, called by God, ordained by God. And um, also with Pastor Sosthenes. Sosthenes was a gentleman who was the pastor of this church. So call, Paul is being appropriate. He's going, he's introducing himself, telling who he is and why he has the credentials, and that he is in unity with the pastor of this church named Sosthenes. And so with those two people in place, he's writing to the Corinthians. Writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth, this city of darkness and immorality and avarice and greed and all the worldly vices, Corinth is full of them. There's a little church there, and that church is holy. It's sanctified by Christ Jesus. The church is holy, and it is called to be holy with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ. They're called, they're called holy by Jesus Christ, just like you are called holy in Christ, and they're called to be holy. Um, the writer of Hebrews 10, 14 tells us, where did the sock come from? The writer of Hebrews 10, 14, who put a sock in my Bible? I think it's, I think it's Fiddle Frog. Fiddle Frog. Whatever. Okay, Hebrews 10, 14. Um, mm, for by one offering, we have been perfected forever, them that are sanctified. The scripture goes on to tell us we are perfected forever by the work of Christ. So I hope I'm not confusing you because this is kind of a new word for me, and I'm having to... to work it out and because sometimes it can be confusing and I just the, the implication I wanted to deliver is that I know there are some who are watching now who perhaps struggle with who they are in Christ because they know who they were in the past and what they deal with and what they're going through and I just want to encourage you that that is not, you I just want, to, how do I say it? I want to let you know that in Christ, you are holy. You are set apart for special purpose, not because of anything you've done and not, and anything you can do will not disqualify that. You cannot lose something that you did not generate. You did not cause your salvation. You cannot uncause your salvation. You are saved by grace. Through faith in Christ is how you access it and you grow it in your life, but your salvation had nothing to do with you. It was given to you, and God does not take gifts away. God is not an—can I say this? He's not an Indian giver. I know that's maybe an offensive term, but it gets it across. He does not take back his gifts. He gave the gift of salvation, and if you have received it into your life— and, be, and, he, and if you begin to unwrap the gift of salvation that has been given to you, been given to all people in Christ, and it has worked, and you, and you have failed, well, welcome to the family of God. The family of God is make, made up of people who fail continually. That's why grace is a continual thing. It's, a, it's an in, grace of salvation, but then comes, we work out our salvation. That's what Paul talks about, working out our salvation, not working out our acceptance. Our acceptance was given to us before we even accepted our acceptance. 
So that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this. You're called holy. Jesus calls you holy because you have been set apart. You've been pulled out for special purpose. Now, Victor, does this create two classes? No. But it does. it is a division between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will prevail fully at a, one point. Now it's still in process. We're in, that, we are in that tension between what was established in the resurrection of Christ, which was the introduction of the kingdom of God in a person, and the kingdom of God growing to the end, the end of the age, as the scripture talks about. We're in that middle process. And God is raising up new people every day. Perhaps right now there's someone being raised up, being born again, being turning and accepting the gift of salvation that they didn't know was already waiting on them. And if, you, if that's you, if you've repented, if you've, you know, we think of repentance as, uh, we th repentance is simply coming to your senses and getting it, having that aha moment saying, oh my heavens, and, and, right. and you receive it. That's what repentance is. It's, and then that is the forgiveness of sins and is, in that is a turning of your life. But it's like my father says, sometimes it's like turning a huge ship. It doesn't turn in a moment. It's not like turning your car from left to right. It's like turning a, when you're turning your life, it can take a long time. But that you're already a child of God and God does not disown you if you make a mistake. You can't disown a child. If you have a child, if, if a mother is given birth to a child, that is an experience that can never be undone. There may be legal, there might be all sorts of things and people divorce their parents and all that nonsense, but that's all nonsense. It's all fake. The birth experience is something that cannot be undone. And God has given birth to you in his son. And so receive it, receive your identity. It's a whole new identity. You know, we're having an identity crisis in this world and genders and all that stuff. And it's, it's I, I kind of, you know, I used to, it, it makes sense to me, not the, not the but, but people are losing their minds. And so they're making up their own reality. And in that making up, creating who they are, just like Corinth. Corinth was a city, we think problems in America are new. They had the same problem. They had identity crisis in Corinth. They had identity, they, in Corinth, there was the religious system, Aphrodite was the female god, and if you wanted to be a worshiper of Aphrodite and you were a man, you had to go through a form of self-mutilation and an act of changing your gender. Gender confusion is not a modern problem. In Corinth, men were trying to become women by castrating themselves in service of Aphrodite, the female god. So these are not new problems, but in Christ, you get a whole new identity a whole new person, and you're made holy, and that cannot be undone. You may struggle with it, you may fail, and you will, but re remember who you are in Christ. You are a brother of Jesus if you have accepted the gift. So accept the gift. Say yes to the gift. You're holy, and you're being made holy every moment. So don't forget it. And remember, with God, all things are possible. Thank <laughs> you.